Hospital Port has pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. Welcome to her Pan Mode TV and welcome to this, my review of Soylent Green, which is a little bit different to the uh, reviews I've done before because this film review is intended really to be a lead-off to the live stream I'm going to be doing on Sunday night. So it's kind of... It just saves time so that I can't... So you guys, I, I don't have to say to you guys, look, don't post any comments. I'm just doing a lead-off. This is, it was a big problem during the Pearl Harbor one, the last one I did. So this is kind of like a, a preliminary sort of thing. Okay, I've watched the film. It wasn't that depressing, actually. I did think when I first heard about it and when people told me about it, I think, oh, God, it's going to be really depressing. I looked at it and I saw it's only 97 minutes and I thought, oh, at least it's not going to be that. You see, excuse me. At least it's not going to be very, very long. If it's going to be depressing and luckily it, it wasn't really um it wasn't long but also it wasn't that depressing i must say it was actually a very interesting film now the uh, the actual book it's based on is a very interesting one it's um it's very very uh, loosely based on a book by harry harrison called make room make room and this is a 1966 science fiction novel exploring the consequences of unchecked population growth and the hoarding of resources by a wealthy minority. Yeah. Hmm. So um, that's kind of what Soylent Green is based on. It's a, it's a loosely. I've not read that book. It's. I've heard of Harry Harrison. I've not actually read that book. Hmm. But um, it's an actually quite interesting and relevant to her panel-esque subjects so make room the the idea that the the title of the of the novel it's based on make room reminds me of the georgia guidestones now the georgia guidestones of course you're familiar with they were set up in elbert county georgia usa in 1980 and um they quite an impressive structure <laughs> organized by somebody called rc christian who no one can trace <coughs> and um he got planning permission he set these things up and um, <coughs> um there's an interesting part of that i mean you're familiar with the georgia guidestones the inscriptions in various languages and uh, one of them is um uh it's where is it now um be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Which is kind of reminiscent of the title of the novel, which is Make Room, Make Room. Two, two words with an exclamation mark. And that can't help... I can't help thinking that maybe one was inspired by the other. <coughs> and there's many, many other things I think that has been inspired by this particular story, both in book and film form. The, the, I mean, the, it's interesting. I just want to know, actually, are any of the cast and crew still alive? Let's have a look. Um, it's produced by Starring. Charlton Heston died in 2008. What about Lee Taylor Young? She plays um, the, f oh, yep, she's still alive. She's still alive. She's 76, but she's still with us. Hmm. Lee Taylor Young, she plays a young woman in the in the actual story called Sherl. And uh, she's still alive. Well, Lee, if you're watching, what do you think? What do you think of what happened? And there's lots of older characters as well. There's um, a couple of old people from Star Trek, um, which, uh, you know, you might not necessarily recognise. What about Paula Kelly? Is she still alive? No, she died. Oh, she died last year, 2020. Uh, she plays another character. She plays in the character in it called Martha. She died at the age of 77. So Lee, so this lady, um, Lee Taylor Young, is still alive today in the year of Soylent Green. I do wonder what she thinks about the film she was in and what it means. I do, I do actually wonder that. Hmm. I would like to what I'd like to ask these people these particular films uh, these particular opinions of what it was anyway um the film begins with these um it's like a it's like a, a cascade of photographs from old from the old world to the new so it shows the progression from ancient times of 
early early farming periods you see people living a pastoral lifestyle it comes forward to the present day with lots and lots of film lots and lots of cars going forwards and then the future and it shows an expanding population and it shows people with face masks that's interesting you see a lot of people wearing face masks in this entire film <coughs> i mean they wear they all wear these hats and the sun and they often have sunglasses and they wear a face mask it's interesting now we have like face masks as a, as a result of this c word pandemic um this was that a prediction i don't know i mean they it appears that there's a lot of problems with the air the air is foul and things like that because of basically the destruction of the environment uh. and what's common in this film a big feature of this film and it comes in the title of the of the book is make room make room means um <clears throat> the fear of overpopulation it's a very Orwellian world. I mean, they have curfews and things like that because basically there's so many people. As you can see in the title shot, they're saying the population of New York City by 2022 would expand to 40 million. So that's a, that's a prediction into the future. Lots of, lots of, you know, people were predicting things like this. I mean, actually, if you look at the facts, so, for example, I'll show, there's a graph here which says, I don't need to show it to you, but it says population of New York City in... Um, where is it? Population of New York City in 1973, which is when the film was released, 7,664,400. That was the population. So by 2022, according to this film, it would expand to 40 million. Well, actually, the population of uh, New York City in 2022 is 8.419 million. So it has expanded. It's expanded, yes. It has expanded, but it's only expanded by less than a million. It's expanded by 800,000. So it hasn't expanded. To, so it hasn't actually expanded to 40 million. It's expanded to, it's expanded by 800,000 people. That's how many more people are in New York City in 2022 as opposed to 1973. So like many of these things, they, they often get these things wrong. These, these, I'm pleased to say a lot of these dystopian visions of the future are actually false they actually are far far too pessimistic and maybe that's to do with the fact that we are hit by so much future shock from the media huge amount of future shock and um future shock being given continue future shock means that you're given continuous very very depressing and very very bleak uh projections for the future to the point where some people just give up and say, what the hell, we're going to die. I mean, this this was common in the Cold War. You know, people, I, you, may, you know this from my conversations with Marcus Allen. People who were alive and adult in the 60s, you know, they said, well, we might see 1970, but we're never going to see 1980. There's going to be a nuclear war before then. We'll all be dead. Um... So this is a very, very dystopian vision of the future. In fact, you see that the population is so huge, you see people sleeping all over the streets. They're sleeping in corridors. They're sleeping on the staircases of houses. The main character, Detective Thor, he's called, he, he has to walk over, literally walk over people's bodies on the staircase to get to his flat. Yeah. He lives with an old guy. He lives with this old guy called Sol, who's a... He was a sort of a el really elderly Jewish guy who is called a book. Now, they, they call him a book. The word book in this particular particular scenario means a lay police detective. So he's, so he's, a, he's a, essentially a outsourced intelligence analyst for the police. And so whenever, so whenever Thorn, played by Charlton Heston, goes into this into his flat he always has a discussion with his flatmate sol who's kind of a i don't know if he's a surrogate father figure i don't know it's a, he's actually played by edward g robinson famous actor this was his last film he actually died a few months before the premiere which is very sad he died in january 73 the premiere was april 73 <clears throat> it's very very poignant actually considering what happens to his character but most people actually don't live in a high-tech society they live in a very very low-tech society essentially you know, they switch on the TV. It's a it's a nineteen seventies TV set. It's pretty pretty normal. Um, and they um they 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 see various 
disastrous scenarios going on around them. So they say 20 million people in New York City are unemployed. <coughs> That's half the population of New York City, 40 million, you know. They're all sleeping on the... They're all sleeping on the on the stairway, you know. Um, of course, that is kind of prescient when you consider that lots and lots of people today are talking about automation, about how automation will make lots of people unemployed. I went into a supermarket today, and there's like there's like automatic tills. You go through automatic till. I didn't. I insisted on dealing with a human being on um, one of the more traditional checkouts, but. You know, some, there's some supermarkets you go into now and they don't have any people on the checkouts. I went into the same one in, on New Year's Day and there was nobody on the human checkouts. And I said, look, can, can, I, can somebody open a checkout so I can deal with a, so I can basically check my stuff out? I didn't actually say I want to deal with a human being and not with a machine. <coughs> but... Um, I just say, could, is there anyone available to run a checkout? And they said, not right now. We're short-staffed. So I had to go through the automated checkout. As it happens, it was such a bloody palaver. Someone had to come over to help me. And I said to him, you know, a Charlie Chaplin once said, you know, machines shouldn't speak for men. There's lots of, like, Winston Smith-like scenes within this particular... Or Winston Smith-type... Um, reminiscing or musing by the characters so for example soul he says oh i remember i remember what it used to be like oh you know we, we used to have wonder we have we used to have proper food things like that because of course one of the one of the major scenarios of this particular um setting is there was no no one eats proper food they just eat processed crap which is just you know, the bugs. Get in the pod. Eat the bugs. Got a nibble. As Klaus Schwab would say. Again, that is quite prescient, I would say. Uh, also, there's another character called Sherl who said, you know, things like, oh. When, when, when she, she's basically a prostitute who works for the elite class. I mean, Sherl is group, one of a, part of a group of women, an entire sector of the female population, who are called furniture girls. And they basically act as prostitutes for old, privileged white males. Yeah, I see. SJWs would say, but it's interesting that she she's kind of, you know, when her owner, employer, whatever it is, dies. It this guy Simonson, who's um, it's this the, the central theme, the central sort of like investigation in terms of a police procedural plot, is the death of this guy called Simonson, who's. A, a senior figure in the Soylent Corporation um, which produ produces all the food she says oh I remember when my grandmother died we had a proper funeral for her because you know when someone dies in this society they're basically just, they're just basically dumped onto the back of a dust cart like rubbish and that's the important part of the plot actually there will be spoilers here by the way so if you haven't watched this, if you, if you, you know, if you want to take a part in this watch party, don't watch this particular video until you've seen it yourself. But, um, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of signs that society is collapsing. For example, the electricity in the flat where Sol and Thorn live. It's basically run by a pedal generator. They basically have a pedal generator. It's basically an exercise bike hooked up to a dynamo. That's the only way they can get electricity because there's no, there's no fuel left, things like that. Now, the posh people, they live in these gated communities. Now, you get that all the time, don't you? You get that all the time in these dystopian scenarios. You, you, you see it in our world. You see it in the modern world, especially in the third world. Where rich people, the middle classes, etc., they they hide behind these gated communities, completely fenced off from the rest of society. I was watching this uh, documentary of a guy who who uh, went to he was backpacking in Nigeria, and um, you know his guide was showing him these 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 elite communities within the Nigeria, and basically, you know, you 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 try going approaching them, and the security guards stop you. They will stop you going in there. Because these are people with wealth and money. They live in a very high crime society, a very deprived society. They've hoarded wealth. 
And they, like, like many of these elite societies within the third world, are uh, hiding behind, they're hiding from their own people. Because their own people will take what they have at, at the slightest opportunity and feel enormous, resentment, enormous resentment for them for their privilege within this community. Look, you know, it's like South Africa is probably the worst example of this. Yeah, so... Um, now, the, the guy who gets killed, Simonson, is killed by a, a person who breaks into the gated community and kills him, and you think it's like a robbery, which is what normally happens. They break into the gated community, they take what they can. Um, but it's not, actually. It's something a bit more suspicious. But what's interesting is when Detective Inspector Thorne goes in there to investigate it's funny it's this is the this is the kind of society he lives in where it, i suppose his behavior is just accepted it's what he's used to and he's adopted it he just takes advantage when he goes in there he steals a bottle of whiskey he steals some food he steals a bar of soap and things like that and he does abuse you know he takes advantage of Sherl, the prostitute and he has sex with her and things like that um it's it's there's so there's a lot of corruption there's endless backhanders and things like that and you see that with his his um his boss the the, the chief of police who's clearly in league with the corporations that produce this soylent food but he takes he takes these things back and he includes books as well because he, he's interested in some books which produce with some some records When he takes them back to his <coughs> flat, your soul looks at these things with wonder. This old guy, he just looks, he says, wow, it's a book, a real book with paper. I thought paper had run out. Whiskey, oh, my God, and fruit and meat. Oh, my God, he's almost, he's weeping with emotion at the sight of this, this food, proper food. <coughs> food that you never, ever see normally. Because they eat these little square little pieces of this soylent red and soylent yellow, soylent green. Obviously, they're doped up with drugs to make them taste better, you know, uh, monosodium glutamate and things like that. But this is real food. This is natural food. It, and there's a scene where they're just eating. They, they Sol and <coughs> Sol and um, Thorn sit down to eat a meal, and it's like this was actually ad libbed. This dinner scene. Um, the the director Fleischer, inter interestingly. The name Fleischer in German actually means a, a butcher or a, a slaughterhouse man. It's an odd thing, you know. <laughs> I wonder if that's it. Uh, he's not German, he's American, but it's a German word, Fleischer. It means a, a butcher, a, a slaughterhouse person. Um, it's interesting. Right? Just, just, I'm sure that's just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. But um, they're sitting down eating these meals, and there's this scene which they had lived originally, where they're eating this food with enormous relish, and they're almost overcome with emotion at the tastes which they can taste for the first time. It reminds me very much of V for Vendetta, and I'm sure there's a lot of there's actually a lot of films which I've already seen which are more recent than this, which I'm sure are inspired by Soylent Green. Do you remember the scene in V for Vendetta when Evie is given some food by V? And he gives her this thing, it's, I think, I forgot what it's called, egg in a basket or something on toast. It's basically egg on toast. She goes, oh, my God, it's delicious. Mm. And, and V tells her, I stole that from a government supply train. You see, Evie, the girl, uh, Natalie Portman's character, she's not used to tasting real food. And she, oh, God, it's delicious. She, she's used to, all she's ever had her all her life is reconstituted crap. You know, it's it's like in, in 1984 when, you know, Winston is sitting down to have a meal in the cafeteria. And it's like, it's like these, these little globules of gunk, which keeps you alive and nothing more. But of course, the elite don't eat like the, the elite classes, the people in the gated communities, indeed the elite figures within the V from Vendetta scenario. They don't eat that same thing. They eat proper food. They eat beef, beef steak and blue cheese and all the and caviar, all the lovely stuff that the rest of people don't get. It's it's what you get within communist societies. I mean, there's a, there's a, the, the bureaucratic class don't eat the sh the shite from the you know the, from the uh, devastated farmlands of Ukraine where people are where people are so hungry they're eating they're eating their own dead. 
They don't eat that in in the Soviet Union. They had like the best food in the world. I mean, what's it? Uh, Kim Jong uh, Kim Jong Il, the father of Kim Jong Un, North Korea, the world's last sort of Stalinist communist state. He employed a chef from Paris <coughs> to cook his meals. His own people in North Korea. There was a, in nineteen in, in the early nineties. There was a massive famine in North Korea, and you can see. Apparently, the people in North Korea, you could tell a North Korean from a South Korean in only one way. Because culturally and linguistically and biologically and racially, they're the same. But the North Koreans are thin and they're smaller because they're malnourished. Well, Kim Jong-un doesn't look very malnourished, does he? I mean, he makes me look fit, doesn't he? And this is this is what you see in this society, too. The, they, you'll see, this is what the plan is for the Agenda 21. You know, Klaus Schwab and his gang, they're not gonna eat they're not gonna eat the bugs, are they? They're not gonna live in pods. They're gonna live in mansions and they're gonna eat proper food. It's the rest of us that have to eat in bugs. We we're the ones who have to eat the bugs and live in pods. And that is something that is predicted by this. And it's interesting actually, you know, that um they do seem to there does seem to be some prediction which is very interesting. Because I don't know how many of you were uh, watched Millennial Yule but Mark Malone this guy um, talked about Agenda 21 and things like that and it's like he said there were books in the 60s coming out like what we know about like for example um, um, Zbigniew Brzezinski and people like that and you go back to people like the Fabian Society the Frankfurt School um, and others who, who talked about the grand there was the grand chess board and things like these books that came out and talked to, they talked openly about the need to create a new kind of society, which is essentially what they're trying to bring in now. And they're rushing, they're rushing headlong at the moment with the C word pandemic. Mm -hmm. But funny enough, you know, um, Thorne, he incriminates one of the bodyguards of, or he becomes suspicious of one of the bodyguards because you know what? Do you know what makes one of the bodyguards of this guy Sim Simonson, the guy who got hired? <clears throat> he simply goes round to his own flat where he has his own sort of furniture girl called Martha, and he there's a little spoon there lying on a plate, and he picks it up and he takes it away with him, and he shows it to Sol, and he says, "Have a taste of that, Sol. It's strawberry jam. Mmm, it's strawberry jam." That's how he knows that this guy is guilty because he's eating strawberry jam. Yeah, it's funny these furniture girls because it's like a <coughs> it's like um a scene where they're all sitting around having their own party. They're playing the tarot. They have the tarot, which is interesting. They're doing tarot readings. Um, I wish they'd explored that in more detail within this particular scenario. But they also have like ice. They have ice in their drinks. Now ice is a luxury because there's no ice in this world because of global warming. And they're smoking it. They're smoking like these things, these long thin things, which are obviously spliffs. And um, when Thorne goes in there, he, he he essentially sees Sherl. He's quite fond of Sherl at this point. This girl Sherl, and they say very interesting things. She says. She says, you can have a shower with no limits to the, the amount of water. Have a shower with no limits to the amount of water you have. Now, that, in, in client, that indicates that the amount of shower... Normal people are limited to the amount of water they can use for cleaning. Was it like in, uh, in Comrade Dad? <laughs> Comrade Dad is a good comedy, actually. George Cole, he says, oh, Chairman Hoskins, he only has three inches. <laughs> and one of the girls said, I had heard that. <laughs> meaning three inches of water in his bath. But, of course, in reality, the elite class within these communist societies do not live. They, they don't actually go along. They don't actually subject themselves to the same depra deprivations that the general population are meant to. They are literally the pigs in Animal Farm, and that's what we're seeing here. That she, the only reason he could have showers with no limits of water, indeed, there's a scene where they have a kind of shower together in a sexual way, It's because it is because that this guy Simonson was an elitist. He lived in this gated community, and she also turns the air conditioning on, and she says, "We'll make it cold like winter used to be." 
So it's presumably winter was once much colder. So uh, hang on, let's have a look at the um, the let's, weather in New York. Weather in New York. Oh, zero degrees centigrade. All right, so this is 2022. This is the actual weather in New York right now because, of course, this a lot of this this film is about global warming. The idea that in the future, 50 years in the future, by 2022, there'll be no cold because it'll be so hot. Everywhere will be incredibly hot. Well, actually, if you see, if you look at the temperature in New York today, <coughs> it's actually zero degrees centigrade. Um, which is interesting. Yeah, so it's actually very, very cold in New York right now. So, again, this is another prediction that hasn't come true. In that it's actually, um, it was actually minus one on Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, so it's going to be, it's in single figures, Wednesday minus one, Tuesday minus seven. It's going to be very cold on Tuesday in New York State. I don't know if that's the same as the city, but it's pretty clear, you know, that this this is this is one of these predictions that didn't come true. A lot of climate, you know, um, climate doomsday scenarios go back to the original studies done in the seventies where they predict they made predictions of the future. And a lot of like COP twenty six and these other these other sort of Greta Thunberg type, oh my God, we need a world government to save the planet types of things, are based on those kind of projections. But as you see, the projections made in and indeed, you know, they would have done this. The filmmakers would have would have would have done this. They would have they would have been influenced by real life climate predictions from the early seventies. Have not come true. You don't have to turn on um, an air conditioner so it can be cold like it used to be in winter, just like winter used to be. In real life, in twenty twenty two in New York City, all you have to do is open a window. Um, there's some pretty disturbing scenes like for example there's a church that there's a church which provides care for the vulnerable and one of the main characters is a priest at the church you don't know what his name is he's just this priest but thorn picks up this child a young girl whose mother has just died and a little girl maybe two years old three years old takes her to the priest because apparently simonson was a roman catholic and used to go to the church for confession but he won't say what the confession. He won't. He won't reveal to the to Thorn what the confession is. Um, what's that film with Alec Guinness where he plays a priest? Let's have a look. Hang on. Because it's a very good film with Alec Guinness, where he Alec Guinness films where he plays a priest who's accused of murder, but the real murder has confessed. I can't remember what it was, but he's best. Of course, Alec Guinness is best known for playing, for playing Obi Wan Kenobi. But he plays this other really, really interesting thing. I mean, he's a very veteran actor. Started in the nineteen thirties. Um, I can't remember what the name of the, the film was, but he plays a a priest, a Catholic priest, who a, mur a murderer comes and holds confession with him. Now, I mean, I, I know it's because I come from a Roman Catholic family. I'm lapsed, but I was, a, you know, my family were Roman Catholic. I was baptised. Um, I, I, I was baptised, actually, by Will in 17, when I was age 17. But um, he eventually refuses to give up the details of his, of his confession. Because the priest is like a doctor, you know, you never ever reveal things. Indeed, I, as a hospital porter, was in the same position. You never ever real, you never reveal anything. It's all con it's all confidential. But um, in this film, he he is actually accused of the murder himself. It's a very very interesting film. Um, anyway, I digress. Back to Soylent Green. There's this very just. There's lots of disturbing scenes. For example, there's a tree sanctuary which is inside a big inflatable tent. And it's like that's the only thing, it's the only place where, where, um, it's the only place where trees grow is inside this tent because everything, they're all dead like they used to be. And there's this riot, the, the, these people at the food market, they're all, they're all there with these big hats and these face masks on, just like coof masks. And this woman shouts, they gave me a quarter of a kilo. <coughs> that's all, I, I queued for hours and they gave me a quarter of a kilo. That's interesting. 
Metric measurements in the USA. Also, they call dollars Ds. The US dollar, they call it a D. And then the riot police come in. Things that what the riots do, they have these scoops. The riot police have these things they call scoops, where they literally pick people up and shove them into the back of a lorry with these big, literally like scoops, like builders' vehicles use, like bulldozers. They pick people up with these things, mechanical things and they lift them up like big scoops full of them and they shove them in the back of a lorry. What happens to them after that? Well, you'll find out, won't you? I can guess what happens to them after that. And the thorn gets injured in this sort of thing because someone tries to shoot him. And he's he's being patched up by um, by his friend, Sherl. And... He says, oh, I, I can't be off sick for more than two days or I lose my job. And she says to him, why don't you go to another city? He says, all cities are like this. So we have this incident of casualization. So everyone is employed casually in this society. There are no, there's no long-term workplace communities ever set up. Everyone is like in agency work and things like that, which we see in the modern world. We see that in today's world. And... Um, he, she says, why did you disappear into the countryside? And, and this is interesting. He says, "We can't. I can't get into the countryside because the countryside is like a fortress. The farms are guarded 24-7. You know, now that's interesting, isn't it? That's straight out of Agenda 21 when they said nobody would be allowed into the natural reserves. Hmm. And then there's a very there's a very sad scene actually because Sol goes to this place. There's this place for voluntary euthanasia, so you can actually turn up at a place and they actually kill you um, if you agree to it. If you're old and you're infirm, they'll kill you voluntarily. And he goes along, and what they do is they they give you this kind of like um, before they kill you. And the actual means that they exterminate you are not well known. You don't know if it's poison gas or an injection or something like that but Sol goes along to this euthanasia center and they say what do you like what's your favorite color what's your favorite you know what do you like and they put him in this what sort of music do you like and he said oh like classical stuff like that and they put him on they, they lay him on this bed and they show him images of nature you know mountains rivers forests things that don't exist anymore in this dead world and they play him this music, which is classical music, and and it's very like Cloud Atlas actually, because it's you know when the when the um, Sun Me Twenty One or whatever it is in Cloud Atlas, when she has to die, when one of the others has to die, this is what they do. They they play music and you go through, and it's thought of as a wonderful retreat, and they just kill you. And um. What's interesting is that it's different, though. Sol knows what's coming. He knows he's going to die. They just sit him and they show him this cinema screen full of these images, and he just dies. But, you know, um, Thorne actually goes, tries to rescue him, but ends up sort of looking through a window at him. And funnily enough, what I, what I read about this, that Charlton Heston didn't have to act. He was very sad. He cried when he was performing this, and he's, when he was doing this scene, and he said it's a lot to do with Robinson's performance. See, Robinson knew he was dying. Robinson had a terminal illness. Maybe he told Heston that, and this is why Heston was actually crying for real. But the director said, you know, I didn't have to, I didn't have to put glycerin in his eyes or anything. He was really crying over this scene. And then Robinson says, go to the exchange. This is Robinson's character, Sol, says, go to the exchange and this is when he finds out the truth this, this is what i mean there's going to be spoilers here guys um everyone who dies including the people who die at this this center this euthanasia center they're just shoved into dust carts just like you you put rubbish and they're taken to this location and you go to this place now funnily enough the, the dust cart drives up to a gate the driver gets out and another driver comes in and takes over. It's as if the person who drives the body to the centre, to this exchange, as it's called, um, 
can't actually um, go straight in as if they do need some kind of compartmentalization. It's interesting, though, that, you know, these people just do this blindly. This is, oh, so, so many evils and atrocities are done by people who are not evil and don't want to do them, and they just, they excuse it by saying, well, I'm just doing my job. I bought this DVD today. I was out looking for a... I was out looking for a DVD of Soylent Green in the shops. I ended up watching it on Amazon. But this is the Stanford Prison Experiment, a movie which I'm going to see. Now, you you know already that I've reviewed The Experimenter, the film The Experimenter, which this is about the Zimbardo experiment. But The, the Experimenter is about the Milgram experiment, which is both the, this one and The Milgram experiment are extremely disturbing, extremely interesting revelations into the mind control into the depths in which mind control has driven us down to, and or human nature as it is. That we are very, very susceptible to the herd instinct. We're susceptible, we, we are naturally, we have a, um, a subservient and obedience to authority mentality. <clears throat> and most people will simply obey instructions given to them by authorities and um, it's rather like in animal farm if in the book animal farm it's important to read the book and not watch the film because the, there's a film made of it which is not as good in the book there's a horse called boxer who's a who's a big strong shire horse he's very loyal to the state that is the 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 animal state set up by the pigs and he, he helps, he works tirelessly to build this windmill, which will give the, the farm power. And at the end of it all, he's like dying through exhaustion. And um, the pigs say, oh, let's, let's, let's take him to the, let's take him to the, to the, to the vets. So they, they say, they, they tell the other animals, there's a, you know, there's a, um, a vehicle coming to take Boxer away to the vets so he can get proper treatment and then go into retirement. But it says on the side of the vehicle, it's basically, um, this is a butcher's vehicle. They're taking Boxer away to his, to be killed, to be slaughtered. And um, what's ironic is that this, the vehicle which Boxer is drawn, they take Boxer away from the farm in. You don't get this in the film, you get this in the book. Is a horse-drawn vehicle, which I thought was strange because the book was actually written in the, in the early 1940s when motor vehicles, lorries, were in common use. So why did Orwell choose to have Boxer taken away in a horse-drawn vehicle? The answer is very simple. And indeed, it's revealed in the dialogue, because the other animals, when the other animals realise what's happening to Boxer, they say, they, they, they shout at the horses. They're horses pulling a vehicle containing another horse, and they're taking him away to be slaughtered. And they shout at the horses, Comrades, comrades, don't take your brother away to his death. And they, the horses just keep on obeying the orders and they just keep clopping along and pulling the vehicle along with them. And that's, that's, your, police, that's your policeman dragging people away into concentration camps in Australia. That's your, your nurse or your doctor sticking needles in people's arms, you know, without thinking... That's the Milgram experiment, it's, and it's the, the Zimbardo experiment. Though the Zimbardo experiment is much more sinister, actually, because it, it, it reveals kind of um, latent psychopathic tendencies in most people. As I said, most people are pseudo-psychopathic. So um, what Thor discovers is these dead bodies are basically being... What they do with these dead bodies, they take them off these dust carts, and they basically process them into... Soylent Green. And it's, it reminds you of Blake 7. There's, a, there's an episode of Blake 7 where you see dead bodies being processed in some way. And, and I'm sure this is inspired by Soylent Green, actually. And uh, Dana, Josette Simon's character, says, I'm too young to be absorbed. It's a kind of a... <laughs> it's kind of a classic line in Blake 7. There's some good stunts, by the way. There's some very good stuntmen in this. Um, lots of people falling from heights and things like that. And um, in the end, you know, Thorne does it. He thought there's this classic 
there's this classic scene at the end where Thorne gets out. He gets out and he's he goes to the church. He's beaten and bleeding. And he says to the people in the church, he says, Soylent Green is made out of people. And then they, tr they, they take him away on a stretch and he says, Next they'll be breeding us like cattle for food. Of course, there's a, if you read the Roswell trilogy, you'll know there's a scene in Roswell Rising that's like that. And then you get to the closing credits. The closing credits of the film basically are like, they're like the deathbed scene that, that Sol envisaged. You know, he has this, um, you see lots of pictures of nature and beautiful things, which, according to the makers of this film, would not exist 50 years in the future, which still do. They still do. And, of course... The whole climate change thing is simply it. The climate change, rather than being a something outside the agenda to create the society we see in Sol Solent Green, inadvert an inadvertent side effect of human wanton excess, it's actually a lie. It's a, it's a a fake. It's a, it's a um, it's a false. It's a it's a falsified threat in order to justify the very very reforms and revolutions that the elite want to bring in to prevent what we see in this particular scenario, which would never happen anyway. And we see we see a fifty year, the prediction of fifty years ago has not come true. Why should the prediction of fifty years in the future come true? Anyway, that's we'll go into more details on Sunday in the live stream. So I hope you guys will get together. You'll do your little uh, watch party, and uh, we'll come back and discuss Soil and Green. If you haven't watched it, go watch it, and we can have a wonderful discussion about this amazing film. Thank you for watching Hapanwo TV. Hospital Portless, pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. <laughs>